if you would take out those Bibles that you were holding up a minute ago and turn to Ecclesiastes, the first chapter. Uh, Ecclesiastes is a book that we've been going through here for uh, a little bit as we've been going in and out of this passage uh, regarding me- the meaning of life. And this series that we've been talking about has been the pursuit of contentment. How do we find contentment in our lives? And today, I want to talk to us about the search for meaning. So we're going to look at Ecclesiastes, the first chapter, beginning with verse 1. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The winds blow to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again, What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy word. You know, at first glance of this passage, you go, well, this passage is quite a downer there. It's quite a downer because it starts off, this whole book starts off with everything is meaningless. That all that we do, meaningless. All that we are, meaningless. Everything that this earth has to offer, meaningless. Why? Because those things, each of those things are temporary. They are temporary and yet they consume so much of our attention, right? The things that are temporary in our lives oftentimes overshadow our attention on the eternal things that should have our attention. The Apostle Paul tells us that we are to set our minds on heavenly things, on things that are good and things that are pleasing. But what do we tend to set our minds on? We set our minds on the temporary things. We allow the temporary things, the temporary people in our lives, the temporary situations in our lives to overtake, overshadow the eternal matters that are important in our lives. You know, as we talk about this idea of contentment, over the past couple weeks we've been talking about what causes discontentment and what are the effects of discontentment in our lives. And we talked about this reckless pursuit that we also have in our lives to always seek out a greater high. The, the next thing that's going, that promises to make us happy, that promises to make everything better. 
But we also know from experience, while we, and I, I say this uh, tongue in cheek, we know from experience in one sense that things are always going to change, that if you're going through a good time right now, there's a bad time right around the corner. If you're going through a bad time right now, there's good things probably around the corner. And while we might acknowledge that intellectually, our lives are very far from affirming the understanding that things are changing, that things are always changing. But yet, in this passage, we are told that there is nothing new under the sun. And when he's regarded, what he's really talking about of nothing new under the sun are our human attitudes, our human behaviors, and how we act. Have you ever noticed this? I, I was around a bunch of executives the other day, um, and they sounded like, and I'll just say, they were a bunch of female executives. Not that that was a, a necessary uh, differentiation there, but a bunch of female executives the other day, and they sounded like a bunch of high school schoolgirls. Uh, because they were talking about how they don't like somebody and how I can't talk to this person and to be in their crowd and you can't do this. And I said, wait a minute here. You ladies are probably in your average age there in your 40s. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt there. You're in your 40s and you're acting like a bunch of high school girls there of having your clique and having the person that's the other but have you noticed something within our own personal patterns of behavior that we carry around within us, the teenager? We carry around within us the infant that throws the temper tantrum, or actually the toddler that throws the temper tantrum. We have all those things within us. I don't think we ever escape them apart from the grace of God. And see, one of the things that we need to understand within this passage is that while there is nothing new under the sun apart from God... In Christ, we all become a new creation. And so that's really where I want to get to today. What is this idea of a new creation and how does it match up and mirror to our need for a search of meaning? Because I get this question asked of me a lot. I get this question, why do good things happen to bad people and why do bad things happen to good people and you should know my response by now where I go there are no good people so things just happen there but people are always looking for some sort of cause and effect that something has to start something and there has to be a, an effect there we're always trying to figure this stuff out now Solomon who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes he was given this gift of wisdom and what he says about this gift of wisdom is you don't really know what you're asking for when you ask about wisdom because with that knowledge comes a heavy responsibility and much sorrow because you understand how vain and shallow our earthly pursuits really are. And see, we keep ourselves from really thinking too deep about the meaning of life and the meaning of existence until we tend to get to that point of ending our existence, right? It's generally when things are getting near an end for ourselves or for someone else, and when an ending has come, that we then question. But then, at that point, it's really too late to question the meaning of existence at that point in time when your earthly existence has come to an end. And even if we're questioning because of somebody else passing, this is what I find too often is we go right back into the same doldrums of distraction that we were in before. That's why we love television, right? We love television because it makes it so that we don't have to actually think about anything. Because if we think about anything, we might actually come to realize that we don't know nearly as much as we think that we do. But that is a necessary precursor, prerequisite to having the, the fear of God and having a recognition of God's sovereignty. As long as we think that we have it all figured out, we will never truly seek after God. And that's where that humility comes into play here. Now, within the Amplified Bible on Ecclesiastes 3.11, we've looked at this passage over the past couple weeks as well. He has made everything, meaning God, beautiful in its time, 
He has also planted eternity in men's hearts and minds. A divinely implanted sense of a purpose working through the ages which nothing under the sun but God alone can satisfy. Yet so that men cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. In one sense this is where... Solomon is talking about from in the first chapter where he's talking about what a heavy burden God has placed within us because in one sense we know that there, there's something deep within us that gets us to this understanding that there is something more. Most of the time when people want to dismiss that there is nothing more, it's because they really want license to live their life as they wish to live, right? I mean, it becomes very convenient to believe that God doesn't exist for most people. But yet, at the end of the day, when I go, have gone to the bedsides of atheists that are passing away or families that are... I've been invited into funerals to do funerals for people that they, did, they say, well, we don't even think they believed in God, but we'd like you to do the funeral. I go, why do you want me to do the funeral? Well, just in case... I go, hey, the decision's been done. It's already made. All I can do is kind of go, well, he wasn't as bad as his brother, and go on and go and have a potluck. In fact, I've been on some funerals where I didn't know what to say about the person, and nor could the family tell me anything good to say. So I go, well, he was a man. He lived. He had some hobbies. And he's dead. Let's eat. Right? Right? Uh, At the end of the day, I didn't really know what to say. In fact, I ran into somebody this week um, at at a rotary function, and and this girl comes up to me, and she goes, do you know who I am? Now, immediately I said to her, that is not a fair question. Why do you start off something like that? Do you know who I am? Because now you're putting me on the spot as if I'm supposed to know who you are. Who are you? And she goes, well, when you knew me then, I had blonde hair and I was pregnant. Now I'm not pregnant and I'm a brunette. I go, okay, well, who are you? She goes, you married me and my husband a couple months ago on kind of, it was last minute, the preacher got sick, they needed somebody to fill in. I showed up there, I went, hi, nice to meet you, hi, nice to meet you, do you, do you, you're done, and I left. But we have now some sort of bond. And she goes, do you know who I am? And, and, and then you know, we fill, she filled in the gaps for me, and I figured it out. And then my question was, so let me ask, are you still married? Because I don't have a very good track record here of the people that get married and then people that leave here. But the one track record that I have a very good one at is funerals. 100%. They are where they're supposed to be at the end of the day. Make sure they're in the ground and you had a potluck. 100%. Got it. So, so you might not want me to do your fu- uh, wedding, but I'll make sure you get to be where you need to be uh, for that funeral there. But anyway, I really digress with that one. But there's something, but the point of that whole story and the point of these funerals is that even when we're facing those times of death and we're facing, we face that time of doubt because there's something within us. And as I, I've told my students at the college before, if there isn't anything more than just this earthly existence, then why bother? Why bother with being good? Why bother doing any of this stuff? And then people will try to say, well, because it gives you a good feeling. I go, really? You know what gives me a good feeling is sitting on my couch, watching television. What gives me a good feeling is spending my money on me. Those things, anybody there with me? I mean, those, yeah, I, I mean, I like, I do the charitable work and I do all that stuff because I believe that Christ has given his life for me and I should give my life for others. And yes, on a, on a spiritual plane, there is that satisfying feeling. But according to the dictates of my flesh, I want things to be all about me, myself, and I. And so if there is no eternity, if there is no God, if there is no moral order and something to hold together the purpose and meaning of the universe, then I have been wasting my time and I need to go home and just sit on my couch and do what I want. But yet at the end of the day, 
I believe that there's something more. Why do I believe that there's something more? The same reason you believe that there's something more. Because within us, we know that there's a gap because we're always seeking to fill the gap. You might not be able to call it a hole, but because you're always seeking something more to satisfy, that in and of itself indicates a deficiency. It indicates a gap. And so we are looking for meaning in our life. We are looking for worth. Now, let's look at this, what we're talking about in terms of meaning of life. I really think that there are three areas that, look for, that we can look at for meaning. The first one is identity. We're all looking for a sense of identity. And when we talk about identity, we're talking about worth. Where does our self-worth come from? Who are we? Now, most of, most of the time, we confuse identity with purpose. We confuse the fact that we say who we are is really tied into what we do. There are a number of people here today that, or they aren't here today. Why? Because it's Mother's Day and for some reason, we have to take off on Mother's Day because we forget that God made them a mother, number one. And number two, God, uh, they, before anything else, are a child of God. Before all other relationships, are a child of God. But we confuse the fact of the, that what our position is with who we are. What really defines who we are? And then aren't we all looking for a sense of purpose in our life? People, even the sluggard looks for a sense of purpose. The, the lazy person wants purpose thrusted upon them, but they still want some sort of purpose in their life. I have met some people, though, out there that seem to be wandering around without any purpose. And how short-lived life can be without having a purpose. But we need that purpose in terms of looking for meaning in life. And then the last one is we look for hope. And that is this idea of a future hope. A future, something that's coming together. We look for cosmic justice, God's justice. We look for things to come together and, and to be right there. Without these three elements, and without these three elements being in proportion to one another and effectively aligned with what God has to say about us, we will find ourselves constantly seeking out what is the meaning of life, what is the meaning of all of this. So let's look at this first one, the meaning of life in our identity. Now identity is defined as the collective aspect of the set of characteristics by which a thing is definitively and recognize or definitively recognizable or known. Now, how would we describe my identity? Well, I would describe my identity as handsome, charming, stud muffin most of the time there. I mean, um, a people person except when you get on my nerves. Then I might describe my identity, well, I'm a good guy because we all like to think we're a good guy. None of us can ever place ourselves in the role of villain in our life. We're either the hero or the victim, but very few of us can ever see that we ourselves are the villain. That's a whole other sermon. I won't go there. Uh, so I might be the hero in, in my story here, but I'll look at all those things. And then maybe I might define myself by my educational credentials and the achievements that I've had in my life. But you know what the interesting thing about all that stuff is? That it really is, as Solomon says, meaningless. To define myself by those things are meaningless. Now, my father's down in Florida, so he might watch this on YouTube, but probably not. So I'm just going to tell this story. Right before, see, I'm not picking on mom because it's Mother's Day. But I don't guarantee that that might not change throughout the course of the sermon. But... But in terms of my father, uh, right before uh, he got ready to move, it, this was him moving to Florida has been a two-year process of me giving birth to this idea of him moving to Florida. Because my father is addicted to his stuff. He loves things. I know none of you are addicted to your things there. And he has lots of stuff. Well, in order for me to get him moved out of his house and into Florida, we had to first get a storage facility up here 
we had to get not one, but two storage facilities, climate controlled, to store his stuff, all right? Then he goes down to Florida. He has been down there seven months without all this stuff, all right? Been down there, all right. Now, before they leave, I, I got to preface this way. Before he leaves, um, on the day of settlement, I had to go with Dave Gofredi. We had to meet at my dad's house one hour before settlement because they were not totally moved out because of all the stuff. And we had to schlep stuff out. And then on the curb was this big pile of stuff that we now deemed as trash. But here was the thing. Every time that I was taking something out to the trash, my father was bringing it back in. And I would go, Dad, you're looking like a crazy man. And he goes, but this is my stuff. And one of the things that I threw away was a trophy that he received in 1995 from the Pittman Hobo Band for dressed, best dressed hobo. And I, and I went, he's not going to need this. And I threw it away. And there he is. Why are you taking my trophy away? I was the best dressed hobo in 1995, and I need my trophy. Now, to me and to you, that trophy, you would agree with me. Toss the trophy, you're moving to Florida. Why do you need it? It's just cluttering up stuff. But to him, it had an attachment to his identity. In fact, he wanted me to bury him in a hobo outfit because he was on a hobo band. I said, you know what, we're not going there, Dad. You're going to be dead. I get to make the choices when you're dead. You can try to micromanage from the grave all you want. But he wanted the whole, and then he wanted the hobo band to play. And I go, really? Really, what are we going to say, play when the saints are going marching in? Because I know you're no saint, so we're not playing that. So, so here's the thing. So we, he gets all this stuff. And we have to ship it down. He comes up a couple weeks ago when he was here to ship the stuff down. 280 boxes of stuff. Thousands of dollars to move down there. And he goes, Rob, maybe you were right. Maybe I have too much stuff. Because I kept saying, if you lived without it for seven months, you don't need it. But he goes, it's my stuff. He found his identity in that stuff. And included in that stuff, by the way, are family pictures. And my stepmother and father decided that they were going to have this process of scanning in these pictures, that tons of boxes of pictures, for the family to all look through. I said, nobody knows who these people are. Great Uncle Shlomo, who cares? Look what Solomon says, the next generation forgets about it. And I said, if your kid, and I told this to my stepmother, if your kids want those pictures, then you just give them the pictures in the box. But I guarantee you, they don't want them. And what will happen is, out of guilt and obligation, they'll keep them in the box and put them in the basement till their kids find them in the box. And then their kids will eventually throw them away. Eventually, those pictures will be thrown away. And you go, oh, pastor, you're like the tin man. You're not, no heart. You're not sentimental there. I, it's not about being sentimental, it's about being realistic, right? How many of you look at those pictures like, oh, let's get out the old family photo album and look back at all these people that are dead? Most of the time, you're happy that they're gone. You know, you're looking through and going, well, my life is kind of good now. But, but we find this attachment to those things. My father finds the, atta you know, the, the attachment to the pictures of the past. The attachment to those trophies. But eventually, you know what will happen, as I told my dad? Because now he's complaining to me. Last Sunday, we had a two-minute conversation on the phone. Two minutes. I never have a two-minute. He goes, Rob, we're getting into arguments about all this stuff down here. It's just a mess. When are you coming to visit? <laughs> well... Maybe when you get rid of the stuff. Okay, but 200, you can't fit 280 boxes worth of stuff there. Get rid of the stuff. And then what I found out, what I've told him is that stuff is controlling your life. You finally moved down to Florida, and now you aren't enjoying where you're at because you're going through all the stuff from where you came from. There's a big lesson there. 
you got to leave the past behind so that you can enjoy the future that God wants to give you. No matter how great the future is that God wants for us, if we're always dragging the past behind us, we're never going to get to enjoy it. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians 3 about how he used to define his identity. Now, Philippians is one of these wonderful books. It's my favorite book. And it talks about joy so much. Uh, Joy is this constant refrain. And here's the thing about this idea of joy and why it's so striking that Paul's talking about it. He is in a prison while writing this letter. And the scholars believe that he was probably standing in sewage, like where his cell was, was where the sewage would run into. And yet this is where in Philippians he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That is not how I would feel if I were standing in my septic tank. That's not how I feel when I'm in a porta potty. Certainly not chained there. Chained for the gospel, chained for doing what's good. But this is what Paul recognized about his life. He said, if someone else thinks that they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee as for zeal, persecuting the church as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Paul looks at his track record as it was defined by the people of that day, and he goes, hey, this is awesome. I got it. Put it in today's modern day context. Got the education. I'm a Christian of Christians. I'm, a, I'm the pastor and I do this and I do that. Blah, 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 blah. And you know what Paul goes on to say in verse 7. And I consider all of it rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. He recognized that all these achievements were temporary. And because they were temporary and really what are all these achievements based on? what other people think about us, right? Isn't that why we achieve? That's why one of the things that has driven my achievement mentality is to somehow get the approval and acceptance of other people. Why do we care so much about what other people think? The reason that we care so much about what other people think is because we do not have a full revelation of what God has said about us. We don't have a full revelation of it And therefore, we don't have a good respect for it. If whatever God says, if he is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the end, if he is holy and just and the King of kings and Lord of lords, then whatever he says about us should be the defining characteristic about us. Most of the time, it is a secondary, third, fourth, fifth. You push it back, whatever God's saying, because most of us are actually ignorant of knowing what God really believes about us. We sing the song, Jesus Loves Me, but does our, do our lives sing that same song? See, we have to recognize that our identity is not tied into our position It is tied into our worth and value as defined by God. In that song that we sing during uh, Christmas season, O Holy Night, there is this line in the first verse. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. Our worth and our value comes from God. We were created in the image of God, but in that image, that image has been shattered by our sinful nature. That's why, where Jesus comes into play. Jesus comes in to, one, show us what we are to look like. Then he dies for us to provide us the ability to be seen as that along the way. So in other words, while I have not fully yet arrived because of Jesus, God has already said, this guy's good. He's got it going on, not because of anything that I've done, but because of what Jesus has done. And then what God does is he gives us the Holy Spirit to create within us a new identity and a new purpose. And this is the good news, church. It tells us That he, Jesus, is the author and the finisher of our faith. He starts it 
and he finishes it. Whatever Jesus starts, he will finish in our lives. But the question is, how long will it take for that finishing work to happen depends upon the resistance that we put up to him. And here's what we try to do is we try to reach toward heaven with one hand and reaching toward the earth with a second hand. We want what God has for us and God says for us, but on the other hand, we don't want to give up what this world has to offer. And you know what ends up happening is we are torn apart then. Because God is always moving forward and this world is always moving in the opposite direction. That's why in the book of James it tells us that friendship with this world means that we are enemies to God. You cannot have it both ways. You will be torn apart in the process. And how many of us, how many of us are daily consistently plagued with this idea of being torn apart and yet we have no idea what is tearing us apart. What is tearing us apart is that we are a people of divided loyalties. The second thing, the meaning in life of purpose. Psalm 136, 13 through 16 tells us that we are not an accident. Now, when we look at this passage, this is a beautiful thing. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Now when we look within this passage, what we tend to do with our human eyes and our human perspective is we tend to take this and try to make it um, that God's in there making the... the You know, making the little fingers and and all that stuff. And in one sense, yes, God has made all of that stuff. But what it's talking about is something much deeper than our bodies because our bodies do not define who we are. Let me say that again. Our bodies do not define who we are. So God, what this is saying, if you look throughout that passage there, it's talking about the fact that God is putting together our soul. Our soul, our spirit, our identity, our per- he's putting all that together. Did God decide I'm going to have a mole right here? I don't know about all those different intricacies. If so, I'm going to have a chat with them. But, but I do believe this, that God has made me. And me is not associated with my body It is not associated with those things of this world because all these things of this world, including this body, are passing away. People go, well, are you looking into something about your hair? Are you going to do something to get more hair on your head? Maybe some plugs. Maybe something like that. Why? The hair is going to pass away. This body is going to pass away. Why do we spend so much time focusing on our bodies And yet we don't focus on the things that will will live forever. So God, but there we see within this passage also that God has a purpose for our lives. The Bible tells us in the New Testament that not only are we predestined to become like Jesus, but that God has established good works for us to do in advance. Before we were ever born, God already had a plan for our lives. It's a good plan. Maybe not good by your definition. Maybe not good by the world's definition. But it is good by God's eternal definition. And one day when we look back, when life, when all the pieces come together, when we're standing on the other side of glory, and we'll be able to say, that's good. That was good. We're looking at it right now halfway through the masterpiece. And going, I don't like the way that painting looks. God's not finished with the painting. God's not finished with you. He's not finished with me. He's not finished with us. But yet, how many of us get impatient with God and the fact that these, everybody else is under construction? And they need to be coming along quicker here. You know what that indicates? You need to be coming along quicker. The more frustrated we are with everybody else is an indication of the fact that we ourselves are not living in the peace. And then this meaning in life in terms of hope. There's this quote, the fundamental fact of existence 
is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. This is from Hebrews 11.1. 1. That's that by faith chapter, that famous by faith chapter where it names off all these people. You know the great you know, Abraham and all these people. By faith they did this, by faith they did that. And you go, by faith I can barely get out of bed. But, hey, for you, if that's your mountain, you take your mountain, okay? But by faith all these different things. And, but this is the thing. The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. You take away faith, then you take away hope. If you take away hope, you take away reasons for people to live and to enjoy their life. When I went to Kenya two years ago, and then we, I went to Germany a couple months later, and I went to Germany with some, you know, these Amer, you know, American, American people. And uh, American people, no wonder people don't like us. We are just rude, okay? I just got to say that. But anyway, he goes, I don't understand what's with those people in Kenya anyway. They're always killing one another and doing all this stuff. And I said, well, what you don't understand, sir, is that there's all these orphans that are over 3 million orphan children. And of those orphan children, they have HIV and AIDS, and they come to know that they will have HIV and AIDS. And why do they have HIV AIDS? Not the same reason that in, in America that people have HIV AIDS because we have recreational sex. No, they had it because they were raped or born with it. And I said, so they know that there's a death sentence, so they drop out of school because they go, why bother with school? Why bother with any of this? Take up a gun, why not shoot people? You take away hope, you take away meaning, you take away your purpose. You take away your identity because no longer then are you defined by who you are as a self person of self-worth, but you're defined by disease. You're defined by a number. You're defined by a stigma. And how many times do we do the same thing to one another and even to ourselves? We define ourselves by the thing that takes away hope rather than the God who is the author of hope. And that's why in Hebrews 39, 40, it goes on to say, not one of these people, even though their lives of faith were exemplary, got their hands on that which was promised. God had a better plan for us that their faith and our faith would come together to make one completed whole. Their lives of faith not complete apart from ours. Our issue is that we are always focused again on me, myself, and I. We are part of a greater we. We are part of a story and it isn't our story. It is his story. It is God's story being revealed in time because God wants desperately for the world to know who he is. He wants the world to know that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so he uses our story for that because he has already secured eternity for us. We can make it through anything when we know that Friday's coming. Amen. How many of you went on Friday? Thank God it's Friday. How many of you tonight are going, it's going to be Monday? <laughs> My friends, we know that there's a Friday coming. And that Friday isn't just going to be, I'm not ready yet, isn't going to be just a two-day thing. It's going to be an eternity thing. So, how do we discover this meaning of life? Viktor Frankl, who went through a concentration camp, wrote, wrote this book called The Meaning of Life. He was a psychologist. And he said, ultimately, man should not ask what the meaning of his life is, but rather must recognize that it is he who is asked. In a word, each man is questioned by life, and he can only answer to life by answering for his own life. To life, he can only respond by being responsible. We sit there and we go, God, show us my purpose. What's my meaning? What, what do I need to do? But rather, God is throwing that back at us and saying, what are you going to do? I've given you my word. I've given you my son. I've given you my spirit. What more do you need from me? Right? What more when we have the power of God within us 
to direct us and the word to guide us. You know the reason why people don't know the will of God? Because they don't want to know the will of God. God is not going to reveal his will to those who are not going to have the ability or the desire to follow through with that will. And I want to change the word ability because it is not about our ability, but rather about our decision to surrender to that will. And so while we want to sit around questioning and we want God to bang it on our head, it has already been placed within our heart. It is not a question for God to answer because he's already answered it. It's a question for us to realize where the answer is found. And so we must ask ourselves, are we a victim or are we a victor? Most of us have a victim mentality in our lives. We look at everything, we go, well, if people just treated me better. Well, they're not. I go, you know, if people would just do what I tell them to do, I would be a lot happier. But they don't. If people would stop questioning me, I'd be really happy. But they continue to question. And here's the thing in this victim in Matthew 25. It talks about the parable of the talents. The master goes away, and this is talking about God and us. Master goes away, and he gives to one servant five talents, one servant three talents, and one servant one. And what ends up happening is the servant with the five talents, after the master goes away, comes back, says, what did you do with what I gave you? Now, the talents represent money. That was money then. So it's whatever we've been given. And he goes, what did you do with what I gave you? The one that had five talents said, I doubled it. Oh, this is awesome. Good, well done, good and faithful servant. The one who had, I think it was two actually, two talents, he doubled it too. And master says, well done. Now that you've been faithful with this, I'll give you more. The one who had one talent, what did he do? He went and buried it. Because he had the victim mentality. He probably walked away and went, I only got one. Life's not fair. I only got one. And so he came back to the master with his one talent. And the master said, why didn't you sit there and why didn't you invest it? Why didn't you do something with it? And he goes, I was afraid of losing it. My friends, most of us are afraid of losing our victim mentality because we have no idea what to fill in when we lose that victim mentality. We are not called to be victims, but we are called to be victors. We are called to take what we've been given, whatever the hand is that we've been given, And to use it for the sake of the kingdom. We must lose our life in order to find it. And so I leave you with this slide and everybody goes. Yeah, that was just mean. All right. Micah 6, 8. But it's he already, but he's already made it plain how to live. God's already made it plain. What to do. What God is looking for in men and women. It is quite simple. I love the fact that we have a God that makes it simple for us because I have a hard time understanding complexity. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And do not take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. Amen? Let us pray. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, 
you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional. But grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really.